this session is um, about personal attributes, assumptions, and biases, uh, the things we should be aware of. Um, and we've got several great speakers uh, in the session. First up uh, is an international speaker that we're beaming in from Southern California. Uh, so we're just going to uh, do that session um, and do a Q&A uh, before we get uh, another set of speakers. Um, so I'm just going to introduce the, the next speaker, which is Duke Han. He's the Director of Neuropsychology Division in the Department of Family Medicine and a Professor of Family Medicine, Neurology, Psychology and Gerontology at the Keck School of Medicine of the University of Southern California. He's also on the American Board of Profes Professional uh, Psychology in cl Clinical Neuropsychology. Uh, he's on the American, uh, he's a fellow of the American Psychological Association, National Academy of Neuropsychology, various lots of other things. Um, he's also the funding uh, member of the Governance Committee member of the Global Council on Brain Health. So we're very excited about um, uh, this presentation. I think we're beaming in um, Duke Han right now. Hi, Duke. Hi. Duke. Hi. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. How can everyone hear me? Okay, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. Let me first say I'm, I'm very uh, honored to be uh, speaking to you all uh, today, and uh, I wish I could be there in person. I actually uh, was at another meeting in Boston and uh, couldn't figure out a way to get there uh, in person. So I am uh, very much honored to be uh, asked to speak to you all and I hope to be uh, there in person at some point in the future. Um, I uh, will be sharing a little bit from our research program, which is to understand financial decision making in older age. And uh, given the short, short amount of time, I just thought I would offer some key points to consider um, as uh, we move forward. Um, and I should say, and I'll start off by saying that uh, I was a clinical neuropsychologist by training. And so uh, what that means is I actually do um, uh, cognitive evaluations um, for uh, dementia and other sorts of neurological uh, problems, and that often involves cognitive testing. And, and so it's from that um, perspective and from that interest that I started getting interested in the specific topic because I started seeing patients that were re referred to me for early dementia um, evaluations because it was discovered they were giving away large sums of money. And so when this was discovered by family members, uh, the referring physicians uh, would ask for a neuropsychological assessment. And I remember vividly about uh, 15 years ago in my practice that um, actually uh, case after case, uh, we would do hours of cognitive testing and they would test normal. And so uh, there was a clear change in behavior. Uh, there was a clear change in financial decision-making behavior, but our cognitive tests at the time were not picking up on this. And so uh, this, got, uh, this was of interest to myself and others who were uh, trying to figure out what was the mismatch here. Um, so with that, I'll uh, move forward. Um, in terms of background, and I, I should say some of these uh, points are specific to the United States. Um, and in the United States, older adults over the age of 65 hold about a third of the nation's wealth. Um, and this is uh, and, um, uh, David Lateson, who's a famous economist at Harvard, uh, who made these estimates in 2011. And we know that there are more than um, uh, there are an ever-growing um, part of our population, um, older adults, and so it's, it's likely that older adults over the age of 65 hold more than a third of the nation's wealth at this point. Um, however, a portion of older adults lose um, a significant amount of money to scam and fraud every year. Um, and I say a portion because this is not all older adults. Um, to say all older adults will become poor financial decision makers would be a very ageist viewpoint. And so this is clearly a portion of older adults that are um, making poor financial decisions and in so doing are losing um, quite a lot of money. And some, some estimates have this at about $3 billion. Some estimates have this at about um, $36 billion. So I've seen one that has it at $3 billion. We actually don't know uh, what the actual amount is because there's no real system of keeping track of this. And often there's a lot of shame um, it, whenever an older adult becomes uh, the victim of scam or fraud. Um, but the problem is so significant in the United States that the uh, FBI actually maintains a website solely de dedicated to this problem. And so this is what it looks like now. Um, and it may make sense that certain older adults might make poor 
financial decisions because as we grow older, we know that our brains will change. And so this is part of normal aging. Some, uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity here. So some older adults' uh, brains change much more than others. Um, but in general, these are the areas that change. And um, if you know anything about neuroanatomy, a lot of these uh, regions are in the frontal lobes and the frontal lobes are very important for decision-making. And generally speaking, as we lose brain, um, so does our uh, cognition seem to decline. And so this is an, um, some seminal work from uh, Salthouse um, showing that close correlation between um, loss of brain and loss of uh, cognitive function. Um, and so uh, I, when I started this work, I was part of an Alzheimer's research center at the time. And we were interested in this condition, mild cognitive impairment. Um, and we know from uh, um, Karen's very nice uh, talk earlier this morning uh, that mild cognitive impairment could be a precursor condition to uh, dementia. So these are non-demented older adults, but they're showing some cognitive impairment. And um, we saw here that um, in a large group of older adults, that uh, older adults with mild cognitive impairment actually showed poor financial and healthcare decision making um, when compared to older adults without cognitive impairment. And uh, these are the specific cognitive domains that we implicated um, in this work. So uh, global cognition, of course, um, but also semantic memory, uh, perceptual speed. And then in other work, looking at scam and fraud specifically, um, we saw episodic memory. And so uh, very specific cognitive functions seem to be uh, related uh, to this notion of um, poor financial decision-making in older age. Um, and so it's very clear that as we grow older, if we do have some level of cognitive impairment, we may make poor uh, financial decisions. And so that's something uh, I think most people accept. Um, however, I started out my talk uh, sharing about these clinical examples of where there was a mismatch. We would do hours of cognitive testing and they would test normal, uh, these patients. Um, and there was a clear change in financial decision-making behavior, but there was no real perceivable change in what typically is known as cognitive ability or what has been known as cognitive ability. Um, so it's not just about cognitive ability. And so I think that's one of the points that I wanted to make here. So, um, and we wanted to actually empirically look at this closer. Um, so in a group of 648 non-demented older adults, I wanted to see how many older adults individually had a dis difference between their decision-making ability and their cognitive ability. And so uh, what we did was we parametrically put decision-making ability on one scale and cognitive ability on another scale. And if it is the case that decision-making ability is just cognitive ability, they should track very closely. They should be within one standard deviation of each other or at least very close. Um, and so and um, we wanted to see how many um, older adults have showed a discrepancy between their decision-making ability and their cognitive ability. Um, and so these are the results here to make a long story short we see a lot of blue and a blue indicates an individual that has their decision-making ability uh, within the range of their cognitive ability. Uh, however, we also see a lot of green and red here. And so the green we hypothesized because I was seeing these patients in clinic. These are older adults who had lower decision-making ability relative to their cognitive ability. Uh, what I was surprised by is actually, we also saw some red. So some older adults actually had lower cognitive ability relative to their decision-making ability. And so, and if you look at and add up all the green and the red here, it amounts to almost a, a quarter of this sample, this non-demented older adult sample. Um, so in general, about 75% actually had decision-making ability relative to the cognitive ability across the range of cognitive ability, vast majority uh, granted. However, there's also a, a significant portion of our older adult population that shows a discrepancy between their decision-making ability and their cognitive ability. We saw a lot of examples clinically, in, um, which are the green here, but there's also some examples of the red here, which I think is a little bit of a, uh, a conundrum. And it's, it's an interesting uh, um, uh, flip to the idea that it's just a cognitive ability. Um, and so what that tells us is that there are also other factors besides cognitive ability. Cognitive ability is very important to consider when considering decision-making in older age. Um, however, there are also other factors to consider as well. Um, so if, if an older adult shows poor financial decision-making, um, the question comes, how can we understand this? Uh, so this is actually a very complex ability, right? So if you think about decision-making, there's emotional regulation involved, there's numeracy, there's all these different uh, real brain functions that are happening um, when you're considering financial decision-making. 
Uh, one way that we tried to make sense of this is to actually use uh, neuroimaging. And so um, using neuroimaging, uh, we know that we can see brain changes happen years before any sort of noticeable cognitive impairment. And so, um, so basically, uh, um, we know this is uh, based on seminal work from uh, NIH that, um, that if, uh, we might be able to see changes in the brain um, that are associated with changes in financial decision-making ahead of any sort of noticeable cognitive change or cognitive impairment. And so um, this is work that was done in collaboration with the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center, or at least that's where it started. Um, and I need to acknowledge there was a lot of um, work that was already happening in this decision-making space. So Dr. Patricia Boyle there has done a lot of the seminal work in this area. Um, and has collected a lot of the decision-making data um, in the uh, Rush Alzheimer's cohorts there, um, which are headed by Dr. David Bennett. And so what I proposed to do was collect neuroimaging and basically relate neuroimaging to the already uh, collected data um, in decision-making that was happening. And we actually have a lot of um, work that we've done in this space, but I'll just highlight one uh, study for the sake of time. Um, so this is a neuroimaging study of susceptibility to scans, where we looked at gray matter correlates of susceptibility to scans. And um, just to let you know, this is what the um, scale looks like. And this scale was actually put together by Dr. Patricia Boyle based on the work of AARP and the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, or FINRA, um, based in the United States. And what they did was they interviewed older adults who have been the victims of scam or fraud and um, tried to collect characteristics of these older adults. And so you can see from the first item here, I answer the phone whenever it rings, even if I do not know who is calling, that if someone actually does that, they would potentially be more susceptible to scam or fraud. And so uh, what we did was we looked at um, gray matter density in the brain in non-demented older adults to see if we can uh, see areas of the brain that had less gray matter density and that being associated to um, higher susceptibility to scans on this, on this measure. And to make a very long and complicated story short, um, we did. We actually saw less gray matter density in the right hippocampus um, that was associated with greater susceptibility to scams. And this was over and above controlling for age, education, sex, and global cognitive ability. So this is over and above controlling for cognitive ability. Um, so what this is telling us is that there are brain changes that may be happening that may actually be explaining why someone is making poor financial decisions ahead of any noticeable cognitive decline or impairment, actually. Um, a number of us actually believe that um, changes in financial decision-making might be one of the earliest signs of Alzheimer's disease. And that's a whole other uh, talk that um, I'm happy to give. Um, but this actually is neuroimaging evidence um, that's uh, consistent with that notion. Uh, I will say one quick point is that um, this is in a lot of data. That I, when you, whenever you have a lot of data, it's easier to find associations. And so there's quite a bit of variability here. Um, so one question I often get is, can we brain image someone, an individual, and see if they're going to be a poor financial decision maker? And we can't at this point. There's just too much variability. But if there's enough work that's done, eventually maybe we could. Um, so some additional thoughts in doing this work. In, and I, I was very encouraged to hear in the earlier session some of the, some of the discussion uh, points actually point to this um, uh, idea. Um, so when I was doing this work earlier on, um, I was really interested in, in racial differences, whether there be racial differences or differences across sociocultural or sociopolitical groups. Um, and so basically, uh, we could expect that there might be, particularly given historical documented institutionalized racism, unequal access to supportive resources across certain people groups. And so this is something that I, I took an interest in early on. And uh, working with Lisa Barnes at the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center, uh, we actually tried to take a closer look at this across um, older Black and older white adults specifically um, with the idea that these contextual factors, these, uh, these factors that uh, reflected historical unequal access to resources may explain a lot of the differences in decision making. And so one paper I'll just highlight here that makes this point is this idea of literacy. And so literacy was a, uh, featured a big um, was featured quite, quite a lot in, in your uh, very nicely written report. Um, and we find that literacy is, is very important to financial and healthcare decision making. Um, and so if someone looked just solely at older black and older white adults on financial and healthcare decision making, there is a difference. 
However, if you count for literacy, access to literacy, the, the ability to acquire knowledge specifically for financial decision making or healthcare decision making, um, those racial differences go away, actually. So this is an important point to highlight the importance of these contextual factors, these modifiable factors that, that could actually be intervened, intervened upon um, to help reduce disparities in um, financial and healthcare decision making. Um, so there's lots of factors that go into decision making. Hopefully, um, that's something that um, uh, might be appreciated from what I've been saying so far. Um, and so a lot of the work that I've been doing at USC um, is actually trying to understand all the various factors that could impact an older adult's decision making ability. Um, and so this uh, we're loosely covering under uh, what we're calling the Finance, Cognition and Health and Elder Study, or Finches for short. Um, and so I'm just going to highlight a few of our published studies so far. Um, this uh, first study that came out of our ongoing work um, showed that older adults who have been the victims of scam or fraud who were non-cognitively impaired actually showed uh, greater symptoms of anxiety, greater symptoms of depression, and actually more problems with sleep. Um, so you might imagine that these uh, that problems with medical uh, issues might actually predispose an older adult to make uh, poor fi financial decisions. Um, we also saw that physical frailty was associated with uh, financial exploitation. So the more physically frail an older adult was, that uh, it seemed to be um, there, there seemed to be higher frailty among older adults who have experienced the financial exploitation. Um, uh, we're also doing qualitative interviews. So um, because we can't, we we know that we're missing factors um, in considering this very important and complex topic. Um, I was able to convince a qualitative researcher to actually interview uh, all the older adults that came into our study that had been the victim of a scam or fraud. And this work actually uh, um, was new to this particular researcher, Dr. Annie Wen, um, and, uh, and she actually published the first paper from uh, these qualitative interviews, and this was selected as editor's choice by the journal, and she was invited to actually give a talk at, at the Gerontological Society of America meeting, um, just because it was such an impactful paper. Uh, and so I'd, I'd like to highlight this as well. Um, we're interested in interpersonal relationships. We really do feel like the quality of interpersonal relationships might have an impact on financial decision-making. And in very nice work, uh, my current postdoc, Dr. Aaron Lim, showed that if someone experiences a dip in the quality of their interpersonal relationship, that results in higher financial exploitation vulnerability two weeks later. We uh, uh, interview people uh, um, every two weeks using um, a phone-based app uh, over six months during the pandemic and actually saw this very nice stepwise uh, connection, um, uh, cause and effect uh, connection um, between interpersonal relationships and financial exploitation vulnerability. Um, more recently, I, I had a former postdoc who's now a faculty member uh, in Israel um, demonstrate that um, on a behavioral economics measure of altruism, um, where there's uh, $10 that's given to a participant and they're basically told there's an anonymous person online, how much of that $10 do you want to give away to that anonymous person? There's no other context. So it's not for a good reason. It's not because the person is needy. It's literally just there's a random person on the other side of this um, internet wall. And uh, people who, uh, um, older adults who gave away more money actually performed worse or lower on specific tests that were specific to Alzheimer's, that are we know are sensitive to Alzheimer's disease, actually down the road. So the, these were not in the impaired range. We just saw a very lockstep association between how much an older adult was willing to give away um, to a random anonymous person online and how they performed on uh, tests, neuropsychological tests that are sensitive to Alzheimer's disease. Um, so in summary, uh, age-related cognitive decline can make an older adult more susceptible to poor financial decision-making. I think that's a well-accepted point. Uh, however, cognition is not the whole story. Um, I shared uh, experiences in the clinic and also empirical evidence showing that older adults could have a difference between their decision-making ability and their cognitive ability. The reasons for that are, are still uh, being worked out. Um, there's a complex network of brain regions that are... Um, uh, involved in uh, poor decision making, and that's something that I can speak more on. Um, but I think for the sake of time, I I, um, I will keep it at to what I presented. Um, there's likely multiple factors, so cognitive factors, emotional factors, medical factors, social factors um, that are involved in poor financial decision making and susceptibility to scam in older age. I have a much longer talk where we cover um, all of these in greater depth. And would be happy to talk with uh, anyone uh, more about these. 
uh, more research needs to be done with diverse samples, uh, with samples that are, are, of, are that have uh, lower education, lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, yeah, th there, we need better and more diverse samples to actually understand what all the factors are that impact uh, financial decision making in older age. And then uh, finally, I, I am a big advocate for a multidisciplinary approach to try to understand this. I, if I didn't have the benefit of epidemiologists, of economists, of uh, neuroscientists um, to really help me, uh, or qualitative researchers, um, to really think through all of the diverse factors of this work, uh, I just think we would be missing a lot of it. So um, with that, I have a number of acknowledgments, a number of colleagues at the University of Southern California and at Rush um, University in particular, who I still work with closely, um, that I need to acknowledge, as well as uh, funding sources and uh, people throughout the country uh, that have been very seminal in this work. So um, with that, I um, going to turn the mic over to um, the chair and uh, thank you again for having me. Thank you so much, Duke. Okay, so we're gonna uh, open that up to uh, questions. Uh, we've got 10 minutes of questions. Uh, I have no open questions uh, yet um, from online. Is there any questions from within? There's, there's one, John Piggott, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Duke, for that presentation. Fascinating. Uh, this is John Piggott here from CPAR. We've interacted by email. Um, just one, one observation, I guess, is that you, you, you list that many factors might lead to poor decision making in older age. But it strikes me that if I look at that list, it could be any age. Um, go through a divorce, you emotionally involved, you make poor decisions. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, yeah. I was just wondering if, if there are particular, particular vulnerabilities which get emphasized with chronological age. Yeah, great question. I, and I, I do agree that a lot of the factors that I think could impact decision making um, in older age could be found in other age groups. Uh, one thing that I didn't go into a lot of detail on, um, on the neuroimaging side, and my colleague, Dr. Patricia Boyle at the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center um, very nicely does uh, in her work, is that we do believe there are specific age-associated neuropathologies that actually impact not only cognition and cognitive decline, but also decision-making in older age. And so those um, neuropathological um, changes in the brain, um, we believe are specific to older age and they, and they result in a potentially greater risk of uh, declines in decision-making. Uh, but it is a, a very valid and great point that uh, some of the other factors, the contextual factors are um, not, age specific, I, things like divorce, um, you know, uh, quality of social relationships, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, a counterpoint or a counter argument to that uh, is that, uh, you know, some people might argue that um, loneliness, which um, could be one of the core factors involved, is experienced more among older adults. And so some of these social factors, some of these other contextual factors could be experienced more in older age. Um, or have more of a, a potential uh, impact in older age. And so uh, from the neuropathological brain change uh, viewpoint and also the, the unique experience of growing older, um, a number of us do believe that uh, older age does present certain risks that are unique to older age. Thanks, Jake. Is there any other questions? There's a question up here, Ben. Uh, I've been your, uh, School of Psychology, UNSW. Um, I just had a question about the, so you said the data on how prevalent financial scams were is hard to come by. I, I wondered, is there data showing that the prevalence is much higher in older versus younger age, or is it potentially correlated with the point you just raised about loneliness, sort of opportunity to, to be scammed? Yeah, so it's it's a great question that we don't really have a lot of great data on. And so I think a lot of people do believe that older adults are targeted more. And then in that sense, experience or uh, exploitation. So uh, one of the um, one of the other points I didn't uh, usually talk about, which I didn't for this for the sake of time was um, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm, a, I'm a part of an elder abuse group, actually. And so 
um, financial exploitation is a form of other abuse. And so we do um, think that, again, there are certain risks that come with older age um, that make older adults more uh, vulnerable to um, poor financial decision making or scam or fraud. Um, one of the other um, uh, points to this that I'll say is that um, the uh, the um, the unique so I, I think it just it does depend what you consider aging. Um, so a, a lot of our our uh, early studies in this space actually focused on very our, our older adults that were um, typically over age eighty. Uh, I was interested in um, middle age to older age, and so a lot of our current studies are focusing on older adults who are fifty to uh, sixty five actually, and then and then up. So. Um, we we are interested in um, sort of later middle life and how that transition into older age um, might present certain vulnerabilities as well. And so I, so that's just a, an additional point um, to your great comment. Okay, so I've got a question I think from Karen, but I might just go to online for a moment. Um, yeah. So there's a question from Loretta Iskra, uh, which says, "Have your studies considered how nudge?" frame choices could be improved mm -hmm. to cater to the variability of the decision-making uh, at the point of retirement? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And our studies have not, and uh, I, when I read that part of the, um, the report uh, that you just released, I, I, I really liked that, uh, actually. So I thought, I think Dudgeon could help, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, retirement. Uh, I'll just share a humorous uh, anecdote. I, I didn't know what super was, <laughs> so I look up what super meant actually um and i kept saying super and i was i that, that was new for me um but yeah we know from behavioral economics work that nudging does help actually make help people make better decisions i think nudging can be a, a tactic that could help uh, older adults particularly in this um uh, more vulnerable time frame we, we do use super in the way that we, you guys just say 401ks in the throwaway <laughs> <laughs> um so i'll go to karen question there Hi, Duke. Um, just looking at your data um, on the mental health symptoms, thanks, brilliant talk. Um, I was just wondering whether that was could be um, mild behavioural impairment um, showing up, because in our cohort study where we see the prodromal mental health symptoms, which are quite predictive of incident MCI and dementia, and I wondered whether it's um, they're actually you know organic in nature and um, sort of precursors to cognitive decline, whether you've looked at that? Yeah, no, great question, great comment, and we have not looked at it, and it should be, actually, because I think it is it is a brilliant insight that I think, um, at least we, from our qualitative work, I'll just share, that's this that concept is sort of, we're stewing over right now, actually. Is there a particular uh, phenotype, a behavioral phenotype that might be uh, predisposed to uh, poor financial decision-making? And uh, we're just early on um, in that, mode of thinking. So we'd love to talk to you more about that. Okay, so uh, we're now um, finishing with that session. We'd like I'd like to thank you, Duke, and I invite everyone here to show your appreciation for Duke. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right, thank you. So um, we've got two more speakers in this session. Uh, I'll introduce both of them so that we can sort of seamlessly move through when that happens. Uh, my, first up is Mike Michael Keane. He's a CEPA chief investigator. He's a professor of economics at UNSW Business School. Uh, he's among the top uh, economists internationally in terms of citations and impact uh, via various measures. Uh, he's a world leader in choice modeling. Uh, he's also the visiting, he was the visiting scholar at the IMF, various other things. He won the Ken, uh, Kenneth Arrow Award in 2008. Um, so uh, he'll be next up uh, talking through uh, health insurance choices. He'll be followed by Ben Newell, uh, who's pr Professor of Cognitive Psychology and Deputy Head of the School of Psychology at UNSW. Uh, his research focuses on cognitive uh, processes underlying judgment, choice, decision making. Uh, he's published over 150 articles and book chapters. Uh, he uh, was the lead author of Straight Choices, the Psychology of Decision Making. Uh, ben is also a member of the uh, academic advisory panel of the behavioral economics team at the Australian government. Uh, lots of other things that I will uh, stop listing now and I'll invite Michael Keane to the stage.
So I'm going to talk about understanding how senior citizens actually make health insurance choices or how they actually choose health insurance plans. Um, I, I became interested in this topic more than 30 years ago when I was still an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. And uh, I got to meet one of the famous economists who was designing Hillary Clinton's health care reform plan. Um, and I remember um, uh, he was telling me that they were, they were setting up a plan where people would have, uh, I think, something like four basic health insurance plans they could choose from. And I said to him, oh, that's interesting. So I assume you've done a lot of market research to figure out just what people want in health insurance plans. And then he, he gave me this really shocked look, puzzled look. And he was like, well, you know, why would we do that? We know what they should want. Right. So and then I thought to myself, okay, I think these guys are in trouble, um, and it, you know, and it didn't work out very well. <laughs> so um, what I, what I'm going to argue is, you know, there's there's a tendency for health economists and governments uh, to design healthcare systems uh, based on what they p think people ought to want, rather than uh, trying to learn what they actually do want or what people actually do know. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present results from three different papers um, that touch on, on these questions. Uh, the, uh, all three papers are going to be looking at the contexts, the context of senior citizens in the United States. Um, this is a nice context to look at because there's a certain uniformity to the choice environment they face. Like once you hit 65 in the US, you get basic Medicare. Uh, so, you, so everyone's covered by basic Medicare. Um, but, but the basic Medicare program leaves a lot of things uncovered. Uh, and therefore, people have to choose amongst an array of supplemental plans, uh, supplemental health insurance plans that cover costs that Medicare doesn't. Uh, so, in, so in this sense, the, the choice context is uniform. Right? Um, so first, um, first I wanted to talk about a paper I did with Catherine Harris. It was published way back in 1999. Um, and this looked at how uh, senior citizens in Minneapolis and St. Paul were choosing supplemental health insurance plans. Uh, so um, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in that Minneapolis-St. Paul market, there were basically uh, four insurance options um, you could, which I'm listing here. You could either just stick with basic Medicare um, and, or you could, you could get what's called a Medigap plan. Uh, a Medigap plan would, would cover some of the things Medicare leaves uncovered. There were two kinds of Medigap plans. One covered dr prescription drugs, the other didn't. Um, there was something else called uh, uh, an IPA plan and something else called an HMO. So the, the HMO is like a closed panel uh, type of plan. Right. Um, the, um, I'm listing here characteristics of these plans. So they differ in terms of monthly premium, whether they had drug coverage, whether they cover preventive care, um, whether they have provider choice. You see it's only the closed panel HMO that didn't. Um, and whether you had to submit claims to get paid out of these plans. Right? Um, now, you notice there, there are two very important attributes of the plans that I didn't list there. One is the quality of the care, and the other is the level of cost-sharing requirements. Um, the, that is, uh, you know, the fact that these data didn't list give those variables is not a particular failure of these, these data. It's kind of a general problem. Um, quality of care is just incredibly hard to measure. And cost sharing requirements are incredibly complicated and incredibly hard to measure. Um, now, a, a unique feature of the data we looked at in this paper is that uh, it, it, provide, it also included questions not, but not just about what people chose, but about what they, what they said they cared about when making choices. Uh, so we had this stated preference data. Um, and what we did in this paper was we developed a, 
a new method of combining people's actual choices with the stated preference data to learn about how they made choices. Um, it, it enabled us, to, the combination of the, of the actual choices with the stated preferences allowed us to measure how consumers value unobserved attributes of plans. In this case, the cost sharing requirements and the, uh, and the quality of care. Um, and it also enabled us to measure the levels of these unobserved attributes of insurance plans as perceived uh, by the consumers. So it, we developed an algorithm so that we could measure the perceived level of quality and the perceived level of cost sharing of the different plans. Uh, so uh, I'll, just, I'll just skip the math. It's there if anyone's interested. Um, here's what these, uh, Here's what these uh, stated preference measures look like. Um, you know, it's very simple. It, we just, just list uh, various attributes of plans and people were asked, well, would, does the plan you pick have to have it or would you like it to have it or you don't care, right? So that's all, that's all the questions uh, revealed. Um, now, as probably a lot of you know, economists hate this kind of data, right? Economists generally say you should just ignore this sort of data, it's worthless. Um, we found in this paper that if we incorporated this data into the choice model, right, used it to help predict what people actually chose, it actually doubled the R squared of the model. So, that, so these, these, uh, these sorts of stated preference questions are actually extremely predictive of what people actually do. Uh, now, uh, the, the one, uh, what, what we then do is we estimate a choice model where we estimate the weights that people put on the different attributes when, when making their decisions. And one striking thing we find is that people care about provider choice much more than anything else. You know, they put an enormous weight on having provider choice. Um, the, uh, to give an example, the, the the, the weight people put on provider choice is more than three times greater than the weight they put on having drug coverage. Uh, the, the weight they put on provider choice is actually far greater than the weight they put on quality. Right? Uh, the, the interesting we thing we found, I think, was when we tried to back out people's perceptions of the cost sharing requirements of the various plans. And, uh, it turned out to be the case that, that people choose these supplemental insurance plans as if they think that the cost sharing under Medicare is the lowest, whereas it's the exact reverse. The, the cost sharing under Medicare is the highest of any of these options. All the other options strictly reduce the amount of cost sharing, um, yet people seem to just not understand that. They basically don't seem to understand how cost sharing works. And the, ours isn't the only paper finding that. There's, a, there's quite a large number of papers uh, arguing that the, the, the data looks as if people just really don't understand how cost sharing works. Uh, now, uh, switching to a second paper, um, another thing, uh, uh, up, until, uh, up until 2006, uh, Medicare just didn't cover prescription drugs. Right? So in 2006, a new program was introduced which would supplement Medicare by covering prescription drug costs. Now here, uh, the copay situation you're facing is actually relatively simple um, because uh, you basically know what prescriptions you're taking. Right. And you can, you can effectively just check, you know, do the various drug plans cover the prescriptions you're taking? You know, do they, uh, you know, uh, do they, am I taking a drug that's covered or not? And you can just check everything, right? So in that sense, it's a simple context. It's much simpler than trying to figure out cost sharing on a health plan, right? Um, now on the other hand, uh, there are about 30 to 60 different plans to choose from, right? So, uh, so, this, uh, so there's a very large choice set. Now, what we've, uh, in a paper with, uh, 
that I did with Ketchum, Kuminoff, and Neal, uh, which was published recently, uh, we find that people just do a terrible job of trying to find the plan that would minimize their prescription drug costs. Right? Um, they, they don't even come close to finding the best plan out of the set. Um, now, while that is true, it's simultaneously true that most people's financial losses from this situation are not very large. And that's basically because um, all of the plans are pretty good. They all reduce drug costs uh, fairly substantially in most instances. However, we do find that there are often substantial losses for people with uh, cognitive limitations, such as uh, Alzheimer's disease or depression. Um, that th these people often seem to be making significantly worse choices um, that, you know, basically just leaving out, leaving out drugs that they need to take and therefore suffering large losses. Um, finally, uh, the third paper, I was, so, but the, uh, just, the, there were, both of these papers show uh, that people don't understand cost sharing, right? but in two, in two different contexts. The third paper I was going to talk about um, is a paper I did with Fong and Silverman, um, where we studied, again, the Medigap insurance market in the US. Um, and what we were doing in that paper was trying to assess whether it's in fact true that people with uh, higher expected healthcare costs uh, choose more generous insurance plans, right? Now, of course, the, the, whole, um, the whole literature in health economics, the, the whole literature on adverse selection says we should expect to see, uh, expect to see that people who have higher health risk want, should want more generous plans. We're simply asking if that's true, right? So we're coming up with a, what we think is a pretty accurate measure of people's expected healthcare costs and checking if it, you know, if that correlates with whether they, with the level of supplemental insurance that they purchase. Um, now, uh, we find, in fact, that there is no adverse selection at all. Um, in fact, it goes the other way around. Uh, the, we found what we called advantageous selection, meaning that the healthier people tend to buy more comprehensive coverage. Uh, so that, you know, that contradicts uh, the, probably the most fundamental prediction in health economics about what people should do. Right? So then that raises the question of, well, well, why do healthier people buy more insurance? Well, something that's been hypothesized is that, well, maybe it has to do with risk aversion. Uh, maybe risk averse people uh, both take care of their, better care of their health, so they're healthier, and they want more insurance. Turns out that explanation doesn't work. Um, more, more risk averse people do in fact demand more insurance, but more risk averse people are not healthier. So that story just doesn't work. What we, what we did find is that a very, the, the thing that really strongly predicts demand for insurance is cognitive ability. So people who have higher cognitive ability as measured by a cognitive ability test um, demand more insurance. And that's, that's the, uh, you know, so the, you have this selection on cognitive ability rather than on health risk. So, um, so you know, uh, what, do you, what do you learn when you put all this together? Uh, so what, what we find is that people care very much about provider choice. They don't understand the rules and benefits of insurance plans very well, especially co-pay arrangements. And those with higher cognitive ability are more likely to buy sub supplemental insurance. I think the three things are closely related, actually. Um, the reason the people with higher cognitive ability are more likely to buy supplemental insurance, I suspect, is that they simply can better understand uh, the benefits of buying insurance and how these copay arrangements work. Um, the, it, an important point is that uh, while these other factors are driving who buys insurance, the, the classic story that it's health risk 
that drives insurance doesn't work. And therefore, because therefore you don't have adverse selection. Uh, now, the, I think the big conclusion of all this is that you can't really use copay as an effective device to reduce costs. Because right? copays are not a, an important determinative factor of insurance purchase, therefore you can't really use them to control costs. And unfortunately, uh, copays are the primary mechanism that is, you know, often, all, one of the primary mechanisms used control costs in both the US and Australia. Um, so I would argue that, you know, uh, you know, that particular approach doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And more generally, uh, any successful approach to healthcare reform and cost control has to be based on empirical understanding of how consumers actually behave, uh, not just theoretical consideration. And I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to comment um, on these two presentations. So my, my remit was to try to abstract out, pull out some messages from the presentations preceding uh, the, the, oh, we need to go back into a couple more. Okay. Uh, and this is in the section three things that we should be um, aware of. So I tried to just summarize uh, things that we should be aware of into these three particular um, ideas. And I'm just going to talk at a very kind of abstract general level um, about those and how that these three things, I think, should help orient the, the general discussion that we're having today about how to help people with their financial decision making as they get older. So the first thing that we've, we've heard in those two talks and in earlier is that cognitive ability uh, really matters. The idea that cognitive ability was a really strong predictor in the data that uh, Mike's has shown us, the idea that cognitive abilities can decline, can correlate with um, measures of, of whether or not people are going to get scammed financially, this is important. But what's also important is to think about how we actually measure cognitive ability. What are the questions that we're asking people when we have a, a, a picture that says decision making here, cognitive ability here, what are those measures actually capturing and are they capturing the same kinds of skills, the same kinds of capacities that people are actually needing to employ um, in the financial decisions that they're, that they're making. And I think we need to be really careful that there's not sometimes a mismatch or the idea that we have a measure off the shelf that says cognitive ability or a measure that says financial literacy and that's, the, that's kind of the end of the story. We saw from Karen's presentation this morning that for some things Get, uh, ability gets better as you get older. And, and I think that's an important part of the story that we need to emphasize, that it's not, it's not necessarily all decline. That that mismatch in measurement is something that we do need to be very careful about. Intelligence measures, ability measures, only measure what, what the questions on that scale um, are going to ask you. And, and if the financial literacy is three questions that people tend to get wrong, is that a really good capturing exactly what it means to, to measure financial literacy? Second point under this um, cognitive ability matters is the diversity issue. And this is diversity not just in um, the, the, the racial, as um, Duke's presentation brought out, um, the socioeconomic status, as we've heard about, but also, I think, in diversity of, of needs, in diversity of backgrounds from which people are coming. So it may be that we can measure ability in one context, but it's not the ability that people need in the context that they're actually carrying out the task. And again, that tendency for there to be a potential mismatch or to draw conclusions on the basis of one um, set of participants or one domain or one area of, of, of concern and, and draw out a more general conclusion that this is bad all round or this needs to be addressed. We need to be really careful that we're not overstating, overgeneralizing from particular populations to populations that need uh, a very different set of needs and requirements. And the last point is, is specificity, which is kind of related to all of three of these. The specificity of knowledge that's required for a particular type of financial decision, again, might not be tapped by the measures that we currently have and the things that we're looking at. The abilities that people have uh, at a certain point in their, in their 
um, as they're maturing, as they're, as they're aging, may, may not be adapted to that situation they're in then, but as they get older, it may be that they have that experience, they have that ability to apply that knowledge in that particular um, setting. And so the question that Warwick raised earlier about would you be better off making the decision earlier when you don't have the full information in front of you versus later when you have more of the information, but maybe your ability is not, um, not quite there is a, is a crucial one to try and untap, to try and tap, because I think how that, that meshes with this measuring of ability, this diversity in the population and the specificity of the information that we're actually tapping um, is crucial. So cognitive ability certainly matters. And I think it's, it's telling, as Mike was saying, that economic models often don't uh, think that that's an issue, but clearly it is. Second thing is that preferences matter. So the, one of the key points, I think, from Mike's presentation is that asking people what they want, what they actually want from their plans, what they want to do, tells us, adds to the predictive quality of, the, of these models. It actually helps us to understand. And this might seem really, really obvious, but I think when we frame uh, the way that people think and the way that people make judgments and choices in terms of these kind of competing systems, the, the notion that they're, and I, and, I, and I know this is a way that the brief is framed and I think it's, it, it's a useful fiction, but I think sometimes we can go too far in the idea that there's a kind of system that's all automatic and a system that's deliberative. It's clearly one system. It's clearly one set of knowledge and information that's driving these decisions. And people do actually have pretty good insights into the reasons that they do the things they do and the information that they want and the, and the way that they can um, form these decisions. And I think we want to be careful not to have this, this, um, this dual system metaphor drive the kinds of interventions that we rely on too much. Because I think then there's a temptation of seeing people as not knowing what they want or not having preferences that really drive their choices and, and that they're sort of being, you know, we're being bounded around, bouncing around with these uh, biases and these effects all happening outside of our awareness and we're being pushed or nudged or whatever towards these different choices. And I think it's, it's worth taking a step back at, from that and thinking more carefully about the fact that people can have insight into why they do what they do. They do have strong preferences and those preferences are going to be an important part of whether or not you can nudge people or change, change their behavior. Linked to this, this idea that um, preferences matter is, is transparency. So we heard more about transparency earlier in terms of telling people what options they have available to them. And this is linked to simplicity as well, right? I thought the, the point about um, uh, in, in Mike's presentation, there's 30 to 60 plans, but the choice is quite simple. Uh, it's simple if you if you can distill it down into the bit of information that you need, and you can make that a very simplified and, and, and straightforward choice. But of course, in some of these situations, the information is being presented in a way that actually obfuscates and, and doesn't make it straightforward for people to even see what's, what's on offer. And so we have to get those kinds of um, balances between the complexity of the information that's there and the transparency of the, of the goals or the, the specific things that people are trying to achieve to become uh, much more apparent. So with techniques like um, nudging or, or, or boosting, you know, giving people the competence to, to solve these kinds of problems, I think it has to be very clear why it is, for example, that we might be defaulting someone into a particular option or why it is these things are being provided a certain premium relative to these things. Those simple kinds of explanations need to be developed, and I think this goes to Diane's point, developed in collaboration with the people that are using the systems in the first place. That, that, that kind of simplicity and transparency won't come unless we're talking to the end users and collaboratively developing these kinds of systems. My final point is that environments matter. And again, this has already come up um, this morning. And by environments, I mean, that not just the, the individual inside the person's head. So this, this session was sort of focusing on cognitive ability, focusing on individual choice. But of course, you can only get so far if you're focusing on the individual in these situations. So one way in which we can think about the environment is the, is the choice environment that people are in. 
So the, the choice architecture, the way we're setting up the information for people to have access to, um, how easy it is for people to find the information that they have access to. But just focusing on those simple individual approaches, those nudge type approaches is only gonna get us so far when we also need to be thinking about systemic change. There's been interesting discussion in the literature um, recently on the kind of behavioral science, behavioral insights of a need to almost redress the balance between an over-focusing on um, the, the individual level and the nudging people and the per persuading people and moving it back towards the requirement for systemic change, for really having a look at the systems that people are operating in and the, the structures, legislative and, and otherwise, for really changing how people can actually um, access information and do better and, and have that, that provision there for them. As a, as a kind of a side, but a related one, there was a very interesting article um, in uh, the, the media, in The Guardian, I think it was recently, written by a clinical psychologist in the UK who was making a strong claim about how Mental health is a, it's a huge topic, it's hugely important, everyone's now much more aware of it and that's a good thing, but the provision of um, mental health care and saying to someone, okay, you can go and have your 10 sessions with a, a mental health professional, but then at the end of it, you go back to the environment, the situation that, that you came from that was causing those kinds of mental health difficulties. It's never gonna get us beyond, um, it's never gonna be able to solve the problems that we have. So. You have to change the system that people are working within, not just focusing on, on the individual and the environment. And that has to be a convergent property. So three things, cognitive ability matters, preferences matter, environments matter. I don't think that's news to, to anyone here, but, but maybe distilling it in that way is, is helpful. And I will just point out one of the things that come across, comes across in the brief um, that um, Raf Raff, Raff, told us about this morning is the, the need to design by testing, right? So we need to actually go and design and test and retest these, these mechanisms. I also think it's important to design by theory as well, right? We need to develop theory of these kinds of behavioral change techniques. So again, there's been debate around, you know, how far can we get by saying people are intuitive and deliberative and that leads to all these biases and listing a whole load of biases is not really helpful unless we have a better framework in which to uh, think about those and, and actually develop some stronger theory about why certain techniques will work when uh, and for whom. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Um, and I'll just invite Mike to come to the front, please. As well. And so we've got some time for questions. Um, oh, I've got a question straight up. Um, Shang? Hello, it's Shang Wu from Aware Super. I uh, have a question to Mark. The finding that um, people don't, don't understand co-payment of the supplement health insurance is very interesting because co-payment is a very common and fundamental feature of all types of insurance and it's related to risk sharing, risk sharing mechanism. So that made me think, do, are there any other findings in other fields of insurance, like general insurance, car insurance, that share similar views with these? And if not, why we can't leverage those good things in other fields of insurance to the health insurance market? Well, the, uh, it, in other types of insurance, the, there's, you know, there's a big literature on trying to test if you see adverse selection if you see moral hazard. Um, the, 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 that whole literature has reached very ambiguous conclusions. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, and uh, it's, uh, you know, if you, if you don't have a clear answer to whether there's moral hazard, you don't know if a copay is even desirable, right? Um, so, but I, I, th I think in the, in the particular context I was studying, uh, I think we're able to get a, a fairly clear answer uh, just because of how uh, this, this sort of commonality of the choice set 
you know, that, that all of these, all these senior citizens have, have the same basic setup. They all have basic Medicare and they're trying to choose whether to supplement it. In, in other insurance contexts, you, you don't have such a nice choice to study. And so people have not gotten clear results. And so, I get, so I can't easily extrapolate what I'm saying to other contexts because of that problem. Thank you. So there's actually a kind of related question on extrapolating from your research uh, from online. Um, Mark DeCure is asking, have you looked in the Australian context why older Australians exit private health insurance? And um, is it rational and is it linked to cognitive aging uh, decline? Um, is there anything you could say about that? So I wasn't even aware of that. So there's a pattern where the older consumers exit. Huh. I also want to pitch in on, on that one. Does anyone else have an idea why? So it sounds like it's a great question to look at. Yeah. Mike? I oh, mean, sorry, Warwick? Oh, <laughs> Warwick has a question. Well, we'll take that one <laughs> um, on notice. Yeah, I just want to pick up um, ben, some things Ben said, which I think are important. Mike's conclusion is very powerful, that you should design the system to deal with how people behave. The problem I have with that is I don't know that you've identified the preferences from the information set that they were using to make those choices. Perhaps a better solution would be to provide more information so that they can make the, pref the choices that the theory says they will make. So I don't know that you've identified it. Maybe you have. But how do you distinguish people's preferences from the knowledge that they had to make those choices? Because it's a fundamental point to the policy conclusion. Yeah, so there, there is a literature on giving people, trying to give people better information and, um, and then seeing how it affects their insurance plan choices. Uh, and I, I think what most of that literature shows is that people still don't understand the information you're trying to give them. Right? And, um, the, the, and, and people like, you see, um, uh, I think people like to make decisions based on on things that are very concrete, right? That's actually the the Ellsberg conjecture, the parrot, right? The people, when, if if something's ambiguous, people will just tend to ignore it, and they'll focus on something really concrete. Right? So, you know, pr whether you can choose your own provider, that's a really concrete thing <laughs> about a plan. I th I th whereas you can try to give them more information about the co-pays work, how they work, but it remains ambiguous. <laughs> so it's also, I, also giving people agency and the feeling that they're actually involved yeah. in the. In so the it's decision. okay. Here's something I can actually control. <laughs> I'll pick based on that, right? So I, I think that uh, that's a big part of what's going on. And, and I think the issue of providing the the better information just begs the question of what counts as better information for whom at what point in their in their life and. It's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. It's not going to be a clear statement. Um, and so figuring that out from trying to elicit people's preferences for the, the different types of outcomes that they might want from the plans or the policy, whatever it might be, uh, seems like a more useful way to do it than for someone else to say, this is the information that you need, and here it is in a format that I understand. I don't know whether you do, and I don't. So the test. Like the, the design by testing stuff, but maybe design by asking as well. <laughs> um, we've got a question at the front there. Uh, having followed debates in Australia about private health insurance and so on for many, many years, I wonder how much were the preferences, is there a sort of a feedback loop between what you prefer and how you behave, what you choose, what you get from that? then it comes back. And also, how much did what people could afford affect those preferences? Because it doesn't seem to me to be very sensible, and I don't think many people would prefer something that was way beyond their means. How much is just good old socioeconomic status a driver of all of that? And especially in Australia, where low-income older people are covered by Medicare, um, the PBS, and so on, 
and whether one of the reasons for dropping out with advancing age is as people become poorer or maybe even go into residential care, they feel they don't need um, the private health insurance rebate, which is widely regarded by health economists as some of the worst social policy ever in Australia, and what would you do with it? That was uh, my other question. If you had words of advice uh, to aged care and healthcare policy makers, what would your three wishes be? <laughs> and have well, you ever given that advice? Well, I, th I think what you say is accurate, that the, the Australian context is very different from the US context. Um, just because uh, Medicare here uh, provides more comprehensive coverage than Medicare does in the US. And so it's, it's pretty clear that in the US, you want one of these supplemental plans. They're a good deal. You, you know. didn't offer them the choice of universal high level yeah, coverage. Right. Whereas, whereas in, the U, in, in Australia, you probably don't want one of these supplemental plans outside of the tax incentive. Right. And if and if you're not high enough income to have the tax incentive, it's not all clear you want the thing. Right. So I think it's very different. So you're right. I would guess you're right that it's it's declining income that's causing people to drop out. But <laughs> but, but I don't. But we'd have to look at it. Okay. How much did income affect the decisions of people in the U.S.? Oh preferences? yeah. See, you know this is uh, an, another prediction of theory that higher income should, if anything, reduce the amount of insurance you want. And, and we don't see that in the data at all. <laughs> it's all uh, the, the two best predictors of buying supplemental insurance are cognitive ability and income, so both of which are puzzling from the point of view of standard theory. <laughs> and there was another part of question, which is probably a tough one, which is um, the <laughs> Did you, did you want to say what would what you would say to policymakers um, based on the, the sort of choice decision research that you, you do for, for people in Australia? Okay, I, but I do think the main lesson from Australia is that uh, I think all this reliance on co-pays is crazy. <laughs> and we should, we should uh, rethink, particularly, you know, co-pays for preventive care. Is absolutely insane. It makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> okay, got another Just yourself, no, no longer. John, I think last question. Then we're going to have to um, wrap up. You all, you often hear, uh, you know, uh, c certain people point to the U.S. You know, oh, Australia should shift more to a market-based, choice-based, consumer sovereignty-based system. You know, I. QS is giving you a very nice lesson in why these things are problematic. So well, I don't know why there's the attraction. I think I mean, that's your policy advice. Hmm. <laughs> John. So uh, I don't quite know how to ask this question. Um, if, I, if, I, if I listen to the keynote speaker and then to Mike, you know, there's, there's a, a whole classification of different sorts of um, um, personal characteristics. So psychologists, this, um, well, cognitive function, which of course Mike has too in cognitive ability, and then there's the question of knowledge, like financial literacy, and then there's effective processing, right? And then that's one way of doing it. You can, you can look at these things and then see what, what impact they have on decision-making, right? Uh, and, and then, at the other end of that, there is the, the kind of decision that's being made. And, and I can identify at least two sets of decisions in this context, which seem to me to be very different. One is around um, uh, biases which are introduced um, because uh, where instant gratifiers, right, or right, versus rationalists, right, that kind of bias, that kind of ho uh, uh, present bias in, in, in choices. And then the other is just sort of confusion, not understanding, sort of your copay. And it strikes me that there should be a, a way of, of, of mapping these different characteristics to these different kinds of choice mistakes. And I wonder whether, 
what your reaction is, <laughs> I suppose. I, I mean, I, 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 my first reaction is that I think it's really important to be clear on when something is a bias versus not being a bias. And it's very easy to say the rational model says X and therefore if people do Y, they're, they're biased without clearly defining what the outside preferences are, what the knowledge that people have is, what the goal that they're trying to achieve actually is. And it may well be for that person at that particular time in that situation, not a bias to choose something which is, is here and now versus um, down the track. So I think that's, that's why I, I don't find it helpful very often to think about people as either biased or rational or there, there being these two ways of, of, of thinking. I think that we have to take much more seriously the idea that people are extremely adaptive decision makers, can navigate a very complex world, can solve a lot of problems. And there are certain situations in which they seem to be doing things that are rational abstraction of the world suggests are, are the wrong thing to be doing. But it's the way you end up with in that line of reasoning is to say, oh, well, these people are wrong. They don't know what they're doing. We need to change everything for them. And without perhaps properly ascertaining what the motivators are and what, what, the, what the goals are that the particular pe people have at those, at those times. And so the, the confusion versus the, the biased, I think, is better thought of as an information problem. It's not, it's not a bias on one hand. It could be a confusion on the other hand. It could be that there's, there's too much information or the information is, is, is in, presented in ways that people just find very difficult to, to work out. Um, but I, don't think, I, I think we're too swift to say you're wrong because you did that. You're biased. <laughs> no, but I, th I think that was a great point, that you made, which you also made earlier, mm -hmm. right? That um, so we you often have situations where we where theory says people should be choosing in a particular way. You know, we look at data and they don't seem to be doing that. The, we the, the the current fad is to immediately start thinking up behavioral biases that it might count for the differences. But in, in reality, they might just have uh, very strong preferences for something that we're not factoring in, <laughs> or just be making the decision in a different way than our model says they are. And we should consider those things. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a lot of food for thought. Uh, and speaking of which, we're moving on to lunch. Uh, so I'd like us to thank our speakers uh, right now.